We've all seen the glitz and glamour of Hollywood's A-listers, but what about their dark secrets? Today, we expose the sinister underbelly of the entertainment industry, exposing the evil sides of your favorite stars. Stay tuned, because it's time to see a side of them you never knew existed. Who do you think you are? Well, I'm the owner of the pie. And does that give you leave to go poking your head out amongst the stars, believing you could take the richest, grandest prize a horse ever won? Number one, Humphrey Bogart. One of the biggest stars of Hollywood's golden age, Humphrey Bogart is known for playing gruff and brooding characters in movies like The Maltese Falcon and The African Queen, for which he won an Academy Award, among many others per IMDb. Perhaps Bogart's most iconic role came in 1942, when he played Rick Blaine, opposite Ingrid Bergman in Casablanca. In this classic love story, Bogart fully explored his darker side, and the movie would go on to earn eight Academy Award nominations, winning three via IMDb. How much of Bogart's portrayal of Blaine was acting, and how much of it was true to life for the star? Based on reports on his unset behavior, he was a lot more like Blaine than you might expect. Bogart aside, Casablanca was a troubled movie from the start. According to Alicia, the script was based on a play that had never been produced, and it needed a complete reworking. A series of writers were brought onto the production, and it's even said that Bergman didn't know how the movie would end, or which leading man her character would end up with at the resolution, because the script remained unfinished, even as they were filming. All this combined, as well as a long list of personal issues, may have influenced Bogart all throughout the film's production. Much like Blaine, Humphrey Bogart was troubled and in a very bad place in his personal life during the production of Casablanca. Bergman tried to bond with the actor, inviting him for meals, but he generally declined, choosing instead to play chess by himself per Alicia. Bogart even ignored Bergman during the production whenever the cameras weren't rolling. The fact that he was shorter than Bergman and had to sit on extra cushions during certain scenes likely didn't help. What really influenced Bogart's onset behavior during the production of Casablanca, though, were marital troubles with his third wife, Mayo Methdot, who he would end up leaving for a later co-star, 19-year-old Lauren Bacall. He was 43. He also had a worsening drinking problem. Per showbiz cheat sheet, he fought with the movie's director, Michael Curtis. Nevertheless, Bogart managed real on-screen chemistry with his leading lady, Bergman, and the movie Casablanca would go on to be considered among the very best Hollywood films ever, despite all those production problems. Number 2. W.C. Fields A renowned gambler and card shark, a gin drinker and hater of children, iconic actor-comedian W.C., a pool hustler, a juggler, and an ordinary man struggling against life, W.C. Some widely held beliefs were true. Some were part of the act. But above all, the cantankerous man with a bulbous nose and a drawling voice was one of the funniest, richest, and most influential comics of the 20th century. While Charlie Chaplin drew our sympathy, Buster Keaton earned our astonishment, and the Marx Brothers made us blush, Fields spoke directly to what made us human. Our dark desires, the unspoken urge for meanness, the depravity which we all held quiet, all the while making us laugh when he got away with it. A man like Fields reminded audiences of themselves, but they hated to admit it. W.C. Fields, the American comedian and actor, was indeed known for having a short temper. While he was beloved for his comedic talents and unique persona, off screen he could be irritable and had a reputation for being difficult to work with. When Fields felt others weren't taking his work seriously, or when he encountered obstacles during production, he would become frustrated. Despite his sometimes challenging demeanor, Fields' comedic genius and unique style had left a lasting legacy in the world of comedy and entertainment. His contributions to film and comedy continued to be celebrated, even if his off-screen personality was known for its sharp edges. Number 3. Marlon Brando In the harsh light of revelations about mistreatment and abuse, Marlon Brando, the iconic 20th century actor, emerges as a troubled figure, leaving a legacy of pain and suffering in his wake. Rita Moreno, sharing insights into her nearly decade-long relationship with Brando, disclosed a tumultuous and toxic dynamic that drove her to contemplate suicide. In an interview for Variety's Actors on Actors series with Jessica Chastain, Moreno revealed the distressing episodes of her relationship with Brando. She expressed the excitement of being with the Hollywood legend, but detailed the ways in which he mistreated her, pushing her to the brink of despair. Marino's candid admission included a shocking revelation of a suicide attempt with pills at Brando's house. He and I had had a relationship for almost eight years, 
Ultimately, it was exciting to be with Marlon. Oh my God, it was exciting. He was extraordinary in many, many ways, but he was a bad guy. He was a bad guy when it came to women, shared Marino, painting a troubling picture of Brando's behavior. This revelation echoes other instances of Brando's questionable conduct, notably documented in his mistreatment of Maria Schneider during the filming of Last Tango in Paris. Schneider, the co-star, expressed feeling violated and humiliated during scenes, raising questions about Brando's treatment of women on and off screen. Marino reflected on her past self, acknowledging her vulnerability and inability to stand up against Brando's mistreatment. She described herself as a different person, lacking the strength to resist the destructive dynamics of the relationship. While some may argue about speaking ill of the dead, Marino's decision to share her experiences prompts a necessary conversation about accountability even in retrospect. Brando's complex life, marked by personal tragedy and trauma, doesn't absolve him of the responsibility for mistreating women. Marino's courage in bringing these issues to light challenges the notion of posthumous immunity for celebrated figures and emphasizes the importance of confronting uncomfortable truths. Number 4. Errol Flynn In October 1942, America was still reeling from the attacks 10 months before on Pearl Harbor. Across the Pacific, Americans and Australians were locked in titanic battles against the Japanese on air, land, and sea, especially in the Solomon Islands. On October 17th, as Japan launched a vicious attack on American forces on the island of Guadalcanal, news of an Australian-born man much beloved by Americans hit the papers. It was the first report of a stunning and dark L.A. story that would consume public attention. Actor Errol Flynn was accused of raping a 17-year-old girl at a party in Bel Air. Flynn's woes multiplied four days later when two more charges were brought against him for twice raping a 15-year-old girl aboard his yacht a year earlier. So began a salacious, high-stakes Hollywood saga, opening a window onto a very different world of men than those fighting the war. In this privileged realm, sacrifice and suffering were nowhere to be found. And this test of the statutory rape laws involved arguably the biggest film star of the day. Seven years earlier, Flynn had transformed from an Australian nobody a Warner Brothers stock player like a million others, to a Hollywood idol thanks to his casting in the title role of the 1935 film Captain Blood. Flynn quickly became an iconic action hero. His was a mix of physical beauty, devilish charm, gallantry, and a raw colonial masculinity enacted in fighting scenes. He was so often armed with swords he earned the sobriquet of Swashbuckler. In 1942, Legal proceedings began against Flynn over the three charges of statutory rape in relation to the Bel Air party and his yacht. At the same time, filmgoers were watching him play an Australian Air Force pilot, Terry Forbes, alongside future U.S. President Ronald Reagan, in a stirring but improbable anti-Nazi drama, Desperate Journey. As America's war escalated, Flynn, along with hundreds and thousands of others, attempted to enlist in the U.S. Army. At the time of his trial, Flynn had just been granted American citizenship. Due to tuberculosis, he was confined to performing war heroism on screen. Number 5. Spencer Tracy Tracy's ascension in the film industry coincided with a relocation to a ranch in Encino, California, an attempt to distance himself from his extramarital affairs and the shadows of Sunset Boulevard's brothels. Renowned movie director Joseph Manikowitz encapsulated Tracy's departure from his wife Louise, stated, He didn't leave Louise, he left the scene of his guilt. Tracy's amorous escapades were an open secret in Hollywood, with a roster of famous actresses, including Myrna Loy, Paulette Goddard, Hedy Lamarr, Loretta Young, Betty Davis, Jean Tierney, Joan Bennett, Olivia de Havilland, Joan Fontaine, and Joan Crawford, gracing his lists of conquests. Mankiewicz unabashedly remarked that nobody at MGM gets more sex than Spencer Tracy. In 1940, Tracy's infatuation with Ingrid Bergman led to a threat to quit a role if Lana Turner was cast instead. Despite Bergman's marital status and maternal responsibilities, Tracy seduced her, and MGM carefully crafted an image of Tracy as Bergman's mentor. However, Tracy's passionate liaison with Bergman was fleeting, making way for the enduring love affair of his life with Katherine Hepburn. Tracy and Hepburn's romance unfolded during the filming of Woman of the Year in 1941, enduring for 26 years. Despite the film world's awareness of their affair, the public remained oblivious to Tracy's double life as the happily married man, devoutly Catholic actor. Tracy and Hepburn meticulously maintained separate lives, 
even conducting their trysts in discreet locations like Barmore Castle in Northumberland. However, Tracy's insatiable appetites transcended even a passionate affair with Hepburn. Irene Dunn, Tracy's co-star in A Guy Named Joe, described him as rude and brusque and revealed his harassment, prompting her to complain to MGM co-founder Louis B. Mayer. Mayer's intervention served as a warning to Tracy to cease his advances. Number 6. Orson Welles In 1983 at Ma Maison, Orson Welles showcased his unapologetic irreverence when confronted by Richard Burton's attempt at a friendly exchange. Burton, extending pleasantries, proposed introducing Elizabeth Taylor to Welles. However, Welles, immersed in his lunch, responded with a dismissive no, and when prompted by his dining companion about the bluntness, he nonchalantly revealed, I told him, go fuck yourself. This audacious attitude was quintessentially Wells, a man who spent a significant portion of his life delivering blunt rebukes to producers, directors, and corporate figures, many of whom held the power to shape his career but often chose not to. Even in dealings with advertisers, who paid him generously for his voiceover work, Wells managed to find fault and lamented being overlooked in favor of his old adversary, John Houseman. Wells, the genius behind Citizen Kane, often downplayed his own masterpiece, once describing it as a dollar book Freud. His career trajectory was marked by a series of unconventional choices, abandoned projects, and clashes with the industry, a phenomenon aptly termed cinematic ADD by Peter Biskin. While Wells, the filmmaker, may have faced criticism for his erratic career path, Wells, the conversationalist, earned adoration for his scarborous wit and self-mythologizing charm. My Lunches with Orson, a compilation of Wells' candid conversations transcribed in the lead-up to his death in 1985, provides a glimpse into his unfiltered commentary on the film industry. Actors, in particular, bore the brunt of Wells' acerbic observations. Marlon Brando's physique was likened to a huge sausage, a shoe made of flesh. And Betty Davis faced a harsher critique as Wells expressed his aversion not only to her acting, but also to her appearance. Even Humphrey Bogart, recognized for his acting prowess, was inspired, with Wells labeling him a coward who only picked fights when well covered by busboys. Number 7. Greta Garbo Greta Garbo, the enigmatic Hollywood icon, was not only known for her captivating performances, but also for her high-handed and sometimes cruel demeanor. In one memorable incident, Garbo managed the unthinkable, hurting the feelings of the usually unflappable Marion Davies. During the filming of a scene, both actresses found themselves on the same soundstage, separated only by the usual canvas. Marion's set had an open and almost festive atmosphere, complete with a high English tea served during breaks. Intriguingly, Garbo, known for her elusive nature, decided to breach the usual barriers. She entered Marion's set, took a seat in Davis's chair, and observed for nearly half an hour. Marion, flattered and delighted, decided to reciprocate the gesture. As Marion asked her director if there was a scene that could proceed without her, she intended to visit Garbo's set. However, what followed was unexpected. Greta Garbo, sensing an intrusion, abruptly halted the filming, demanding to know who was present. Fred Niblo, the director, swiftly instructed Marion to leave, emphasizing Garbo's strict rule against anyone on her sets. Undeterred, Marion explained, I know, but Miss Garbo came on my set and I thought I'd repay the compliment, attempting to diffuse the tension. Marion engaged Garbo in conversation on her own set, displaying her social graces. However, Garbo, with her trademark disdain, dismissed Marion's attempt at camaraderie. In a cutting remark, Garbo claimed, You're very funny, you make me laugh. I didn't come over to see you. I came over to see a really great actress, Jetta Goodall. The impact of this insult brought tears to Marion's eyes, but Garbo remained unapologetic. As Marion left, Garbo's final words stung. To me, you're null and void. This incident, recounted by Marion Davies, exemplifies Garbo's complex and solitary nature, which often bordered on peevishness. Despite Garbo's friends defending her as merely slightly cranky, such incidents reveal the less charming aspects of her personality. Marion Davies, at a later reception attended by Garbo, remarked, I never saw anyone so peculiar or so shy, and that's saying a lot for this town a town known for its eccentricities and larger-than-life personas. Number 8. Frank Sinatra 
In 1938, the smooth crooner Frank Sinatra found himself in an unexpected predicament that landed him behind bars. Charged with seduction, a serious accusation in the moral climate of the 30s, Sinatra was accused of corrupting an upstanding single woman in the community. The charge, eventually dismissed, led to Sinatra's brief stint in jail. However, his tryst with legal troubles didn't end there. On December 22nd of the same year, Sinatra was back in jail, this time facing charges of adultery. Authorities discovered that Sinatra's lady friend was married, intensifying the legal scrutiny. Despite the initial fervor, the case was dropped, and Sinatra spent a total of 16 hours in jail before regaining his freedom. This episode highlighted Sinatra's womanizing reputation and added a unique chapter to his storied life. In a surprising turn of events, the infamous J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, took a keen interest in Frank Sinatra. Hoover, known for his conservative values and opposition to figures he deemed subversive, opened an FBI file on Sinatra. However, despite the extensive 1,300-page file, the FBI struggled to find substantial evidence against the iconic singer. The declassified FBI file, dating back to Sinatra's death in 1998, revealed investigations into Sinatra's associations and health records. While there were claims that Sinatra volunteered as an FBI informant, the real curiosity lay in the file's origin. An anonymous tipster, writing to Hoover in 1943, expressed concern about Sinatra's shrill whistling sound created by girls cheering during his performances. The letter suggested that such mass hysteria could be manipulated, leading to the creation of another Hitler in America. Hoover, ever vigilant, agreed with this assessment, initiating a 40-year investigation into the man whose voice stirred passionate devotion. Frank Sinatra's life, marked by legal entanglements and FBI scrutiny, showcased the intersection of entertainment, morality, and political paranoia in 20th century America. Number 9. Elizabeth Taylor in the late 1950s, the Hollywood headlines were ablaze with the scandalous love affair that unfolded between Elizabeth Taylor and singer Eddie Fisher. The twist in this tale? Fisher was initially the best man in Taylor's third wedding to producer Mike Todd, who tragically passed away. Meanwhile, Fisher was married to actor Debbie Reynolds, and the social dynamics of these two couples were about to take a dramatic turn. Taylor and Reynolds had a long-standing friendship dating back to their teenage years, but the sudden loss of Todd shifted the dynamics. Taylor found solace in Fisher, leading to an affair that scandalized Hollywood. The fallout, however, was not evenly distributed. While Taylor and Reynolds weathered the storm, Fisher faced the brunt of public outrage and professional consequences. The affair had a severe impact on Fisher's career, with contracts being canceled due to morality clauses. Todd Fisher, Eddie Fisher's son, revealed the extent of the fallout, stating, it literally ruined his career. I mean, it just wiped him out. Despite Fisher being both a singer and actor, his professional life took a significant hit, and even his struggle with drug abuse added to his challenges. Fisher, reflecting on the aftermath, acknowledged the overshadowing effect of his romantic life on other aspects. It wasn't my intention for my romantic life to overshadow other aspects, he said in 1991. I know that it has. The marriage between Elizabeth Taylor and Eddie Fisher lasted for five years, but it began to unravel two years in. Taylor's iconic role in Cleopatra, alongside Richard Burton, fueled a highly publicized affair that eventually led to a divorce between Taylor and Fisher in 1964. Taylor and Burton went on to have their own highly publicized romance, marrying shortly after the divorce. Debbie Reynolds, reflecting on the doomed union, foresaw its demise, commenting, I warned Eddie that she'd kick him out after a year and a half, and that's exactly what happened, which gave me at least a little comfort. Number 10. Faye Dunaway Page Six recently reported the tumultuous downfall of the 78-year-old silver screen icon Faye Dunaway, who was ousted from her role in T at 5. Accused of physical assault, tantrums, and bizarre demands on set, Dunaway's alleged behavior has been a topic of discussion for years. One of the alarming incidents involved Rutanya Alda, who, during the filming of Mommy Dearest in 1981, claimed to have been genuinely slapped by Dunaway. Alda recounted, instead of doing a stage slap, she slapped me on the cheek hard and for real. Beyond on-set altercations, Broadway wig designer Paul Huntley revealed an incident during a 1966 tour of Masterclass, where Dunaway, dissatisfied with the presentation of hairpins, 
reportedly slapped Huntley's assistant's hand, leaving the assistant horrified. Page Six also revisited a claim from the book Easy Riders and Raging Bulls, alleging that Dunaway made Teamsters flush her toilet on the set of Chinatown in 1974. She supposedly peed in trash cans and threw a cup of urine at director Roman Polanski when denied a bathroom break. In response, Dunaway stated that she had no recollection of these events and deemed them ridiculous. James Woods shared his encounter with Dunaway during the filming of Disappearance of Amy in 1976, claiming she threw something at him for ad-libbing a line. Woods criticized Dunaway's rudeness, contrasting it with Betty Davis, who reportedly considered Dunaway among the worst people in Hollywood. Page Six also reported Dunaway's failure to learn lines for Tea at Five, supported by singer Jill Sobule's recollection of Dunaway's behavior during the disappearance of Amy. Sobule described Dunaway as hours late in a foul mood, yelling at people and storming off the set, creating a scene reminiscent of Valley of the Dolls. Number 11. Mickey Rooney Mickey Rooney, with his boyish charm, illuminated the golden age of Hollywood, earning four Academy Award nominations. His collaborations with Judy Garland and his portrayal of Andy Hardy epitomized post-war optimism and small-town innocence, captivating audiences. However, behind the scenes, Rooney's off-screen persona diverged drastically from his on-screen characters. Rooney's struggle with gambling and substance abuse cast a shadow on his public image. Reports of his inappropriate behavior on set, including auditioning young actresses on the infamous casting couch for non-existent roles, paint a disturbing picture. One particularly alarming allegation suggests an affair with a 14-year-old Elizabeth Taylor while Rooney was in his 20s and married. Decider reveals a Mickey Rooney starkly different from the honest and innocent characters he portrayed. Described as a blisteringly bombastic, abrasive, and nasty, Rooney's professional demeanor was far from amicable. His unkind remarks about co-stars, including derogatory comments about Elizabeth Taylor, exemplify a darker side that contradicts the public's perception of him. Even after completing productions, Rooney's poor professional behavior persisted. Following his co-starring role with Elizabeth Taylor in National Velvet in 1944, Rooney disparaged the young star, labeling her as entitled and lacking talent. Number 12. Kirk Douglas Born Isur Danielovich Demsky to Russian Jewish immigrants in 1916, Douglas's journey from humble beginnings to iconic actor mirrors the evolution of American cinema itself. His cinematic achievements, highlighted by his role in breaking the Hollywood blacklist, resonate as much as his on-screen performances. Douglas played a pivotal part in the production of Spartacus, hiring Dalton Trumbo, a blacklisted writer, to pen the script. This move not only showcased Douglas's commitment to artistic freedom, but also contributed to dismantling the oppressive Hollywood blacklist. However, in the aftermath of his death, a different narrative emerged, one shrouded in allegations that have circulated for years. Rumors suggested that Douglas had sexually assaulted a teenage Natalie Wood in the 1950s, casting a shadow on his legacy. The unverified story claimed Douglas invited the 15-year-old Wood to his room at the Chateau Marmont, subjected her to hours of assault, and callously warned her against speaking out. While the veracity of this account remains unconfirmed, social media quickly became a battleground of contrasting tributes and accusations. Douglas, posthumously labeled a pedophile and rapist, faced a retrospective trial by public opinion. A film critic's assertion that he was most probably a sexual predator who went unpunished and unchallenged for half a century encapsulates the divisive nature of the posthumous reckoning. Number 13. Steve McQueen Nellie Adams, McQueen's wife in the tumultuous journey of the 1950s to the 70s, bore witness to the dark side of this Hollywood legend. Their marriage, marred by McQueen's serial womanizing and various addictions, took a harrowing turn one fateful night. Adams, aware of her husband's cocaine habit, resisted his persistent attempts to involve her. However, McQueen's charm was a facade for a more menacing reality. I wish you wouldn't fight me on this, he allegedly pleaded. I promise you a little coke will make you feel better. I don't want you feeling bad, baby. No matter what happens, you're still my baby. As the night unfolded fueled by lines of cocaine, McQueen's paranoia escalated. He accused Adams of infidelity, prompting a teasing response from her about a mysterious Academy Award-winning lover. In a chilling moment, McQueen, overcome with rage, retrieved a gun from his pocket and pressed it against Adams' temple. The threat that followed was nothing short of horrifying. 
You'd better tell me now, or you're not going to live to see him die. And I promise you I'll find out who the mother is. Make no mistake about that, he whispered menacingly. Number 14. Lucille Ball Lucille Ball, renowned as the queen of comedy, was an influential figure in the entertainment industry. However, behind the scenes of Here's Lucy, a 1971 episode titled Lucy and the Mountain Climber revealed a side of Ball that some found challenging to navigate. During a guest appearance by Tony Randall, who was at the height of his popularity on The Odd Couple, he witnessed Ball's strong-willed demeanor. In the episode, Randall played a mountain climber whom Lucy believed she could outdo. Reflecting on the experience, Randall noted, A lot of people found her very, very tough to work with. She bossed everybody around and didn't spare anybody's feelings. Despite the challenges, Randall acknowledged that Ball's assertiveness was part of what made her a comedic genius. He remarked, However, he also saw Ball's attitude and dedication to making the best possible show as part of what made her such a comedic genius. I didn't mind that because she knew what she was doing. If someone just says, do this, it's awful if they're wrong. If they're right, it just saves a lot of time. And she was always right. Number 15. James Dean James Dean, the iconic actor immortalized for his roles in classics like Rebel Without a Cause, may be celebrated on postage stamps, but a closer look reveals a tumultuous personality that leaves many questioning the adoration. Depicted as obnoxious in Donald Spoto's Rebel, The Life and Legend of James Dean, the actor's off-screen behavior raises eyebrows, considering the accolades he received posthumously. According to Spoto, Dean was excessively rude, foul-mouthed, and unprofessional, earning the disdain of many co-stars. His brief stint on Broadway in productions like See the Jaguar 1952 and The Immortalist 1954 was marred by tales of uncooperativeness and moodiness. Robert Ullman, the press representative for the latter play, didn't mince words. James Dean was the most uncooperative, the moodiest, and most offensive actor I've ever worked with. Even the late Rock Hudson, who shared the screen with Dean in Giant, found him challenging to be around. Hudson remarked, Dean was hard to be around. He never smiled, was sulky, and had no manners. Despite these anecdotes, Dean's enigmatic persona, marked by rebellion and an untimely death at 24 in a gruesome auto accident, has garnered an immense cult following. While novels, plays, and songs like The Beach Boys' A Young Man Is Gone have romanticized Dean's life, not every portrayal has been adoring. In 1993, conservative columnist George Will laid blame on Dean, attributing the youthful unrest of the 1960s to his film personality. Will contended, in Rebel, Dean played himself, a mumbling, arrested development adolescent to perfection feeling mighty sorry for himself as a victim of insensitive parents. Yet, Dean's complexity extended beyond the surly rebel image. Creative, intellectually curious, and ambitious, he was also manipulative and selfish. Accounts from actors who worked with him reveal a less glamorous side. Vaughn Taylor, an actor who collaborated with Dean on TV, recalled decades later the actor's vulgar, self-congratulatory, and rude behavior. Dean's improvised stage movements cause chaos, disrupting other actors' performances and infuriating directors. Number 16. Jerry Lewis Known to millions for his iconic partnership with Dean Martin and his tireless efforts in hosting telethon fundraisers for the Muscular Dystrophy Association, Lewis was a man of two sides, the celebrated entertainer and the tormented soul. Lewis, often dubbed the Dark Prince of Comedy, navigated a tumultuous life that mirrored the highs and lows of his comedic style. From an unhappy childhood to an unfaithful marriage, from drug addiction to a suicide attempt, and from controversy to debilitating illnesses, his journey was marked by profound struggles. Despite his success and influence on comedy, Lewis grappled with personal demons that often overshadowed his public persona. His slapstick style, a comedic artistry that influenced figures like Michael Crawford's Frank Spencer in Some Mothers Do Have em, and Hollywood A-lister Jim Carrey showcased the depth of his impact on the industry. Jim Carrey, paying tribute to Lewis, encapsulated the sentiment shared by many. I am because he was. Even Martin Scorsese, who directed Lewis in the 1983 film The King of Comedy, acknowledged him as truly one of our greats. However, behind the accolades and laughter lay a darker reality. 
Accusations of cruelty and abuse haunted Lewis's personal life, with his youngest son, Joseph, publicly stating that he endured routine physical and mental abuse from his father. The strange relationship led to Jerry cutting ties with Joseph, who tragically passed away from an overdose in 2009 at the age of 45. Jerry's response to his son's death, marked by silence and absence, spoke volumes about the complex dynamics within the Lewis family. In a rare moment of vulnerability, Jerry Lewis admitted to self-flagellation over his son's death, confessing to beating himself up a thousand times. He revealed, I've worked under the most painful conditions any man has ever felt in his life, but when I walk out on that stage, the pain goes away. Number 17. Betty Davis In her 1962 autobiography, The Lonely Life, and his 1987 follow-up, This and That, Davis unleashed a torrent of opinions ranging from sharp critiques to surprisingly tender reflections, offering a glimpse into a life that transcended the narrative presented in the 2017 series Feud, chronicling her infamous rivalry with Joan Crawford. Davis's relentless pursuit of perfection stemmed from a complex relationship with her father, Harlow, a stern and demanding Harvard-trained patent lawyer. In a poignant moment described in The Lonely Life, Davis recounted staring at the stars with her father, who imparted a lesson that fueled her determination. Do you see all those stars up there? There are millions and millions of them. Remember that always, and you'll know how unimportant you are. This paternal challenge became a driving force in Davis's life as she sought to prove her worth to herself and the world. Her journey wasn't without adversary, and two prominent figures loomed large among them. Jack Warner, the head of Warner Brothers Studio, and her eternal rival, Joan Crawford. Davis spared no words in her assessments, accusing Crawford of being a vain, vodka and Pepsi-swilling, skilled sexual politician. The tension between the two Hollywood icons reached its zenith during the filming of Feud, with freezing sets and Crawford's insistence on impeccable nails adding fuel to the fire. As Davis navigated the tumultuous waters of Hollywood, her opinions resonated beyond the silver screen. She was unapologetically herself, a maverick challenging the norms of an industry that often resisted change. In her words, I will not retire while I've still got my legs and my makeup box. Number 18. Joan Crawford When it comes to Hollywood, few revelations have shocked the world as profoundly as Christina Crawford's tell-all memoir, Mommy Dearest, published in 1978. In this explosive expose, Christina peeled back the glamorous facade surrounding her mother, the legendary Hollywood film star Joan Crawford, revealing a dark and abusive reality that lurked behind closed doors. At the tender age of 13, Christina's perception of her mother as a loving figure shattered. A traumatic incident etched into her memory involved Joan grabbing her by the throat, delivering a punch to her face and slamming her head against the floor. Even after 55 years, Christina vividly recalls the harrowing details, emphasizing how close her mother came to inflicting fatal harm. It was up close and personal. She came this far from my face and you could see it in her eyes. You can see if someone is trying to kill you, Christina reflects. What made Joan Crawford's case particularly chilling was the stark dichotomy between her public persona and the private torment Christina endured. To the world, Crawford was the epitome of Hollywood glamour, a celebrated actress whose career spanned five decades, starring alongside icons like Clark Gable and Betty Davis. Her fame reached its zenith in the 1940s, earning her accolades, including a Best Actress Academy Award in 1945 for Mildred Pierce. Despite the glossy magazine spreads depicting a happy family life in her sprawling Los Angeles mansion, Christina saw through the facade. A year after Crawford's death, Christina unleashed the truth in Mommy Dearest, accusing her mother of sadistic perfectionism, alcoholism, and unpredictable fits of maternal rage. The autobiography painted a portrait of a woman who, behind the scenes, wielded her power not as a nurturing parent but as a tyrant punishing the slightest transgressions with disproportionate cruelty. Number 19. John Wayne As Wayne wielded his influence during the classic era of Hollywood, his conservative political views and controversial personal opinions created a storm among his peers. Some co-stars found themselves at odds with the cinema legend due to his outspoken beliefs. Among those who felt the sting of Wayne's vitriol was none other than the legendary Clark Gable. Gable, celebrated for his looks and talent, crossed paths with Wayne during the production of John Ford's 1953 movie, Mogambo. However, 
What should have been a harmonious collaboration turned into a tumultuous relationship. On set, Ford's comments about Gable's appearance and age soured the atmosphere, leading to frequent clashes between the two Hollywood giants. The breaking point came when Ford's disrespect extended beyond Gable to include his co-star Ava Gardner. Gable, incensed by Ford's treatment of the actors and his disregard for their feelings, walked off set multiple times, severing ties with the director for good. John Wayne's daughter, Aisa Wayne, shed light on the long-standing feud between Gable and Ford, revealing its lasting impact on her father's perception of the fellow actor. In her book, John Wayne, My Father, Aisa explained that the animosity simmered for years, with John Wayne staunchly standing by Ford. To Wayne, speaking ill of Gable became a course of action, even if he had no personal qualms with the actor. He's extremely handsome in person, Wayne remarked, but Gable's an idiot. Do you know why Gable's an actor? It's the only thing he's smart enough to do. Such remarks, while reflecting Wayne's disdain, also raised questions about the industry's perception of intelligence and talent. Number 20. Charlie Chaplin It is true that Charlie Chaplin was a slapstick comedian, but beyond that he was a selfish, raging megalomaniac who treated his children and teenage wives with relentless cruelty. That depends entirely on your definition of a horrible human being. Charlie Chaplin was attracted to much younger women. His first wife was 16, he was nearly 30. As a way to avoid being jailed for having sex with a minor, he knocked up his second wife when she was 15, then married her. His first wife gave him one son who died young. Wife number two gave him two sons. Number three, though young, failed to provide Chaplin with an heir, so he quickly bored of her. At the age of 50, he began a relationship with Una O'Neill, who was 17 years old. She was 18 when he married her. Charlie Chaplin's whole life seems to have been a revolving door of very young girlfriends and spouses. But the main thing he seemed to have been after wasn't just their pretty faces, but their youth and fertility. The third time for Chaplin was a charm, as Una got pregnant almost immediately and ended up giving birth to eight children, bringing the total number of surviving little Chaplins to ten. The man left his mark on the world, and he did so well. He left behind a body of work that was and remains truly impressive. At the same time, he also viewed teenage lovers as the fountain of eternal youth. His final wife, Una, survived Chaplin by only 14 years, despite being almost 40 years younger than her famous husband. She ended up dying of alcoholism, depressed and kind of sad to never have had a childhood. She was the only one of his wives who lasted until his death, and the main reason for her staying power was the many children she gave him. He loved showing off his numerous offspring to his many famous house guests in their Swiss home, beaming with pride at his own prowess. This was the recurring theme in Chaplin's life. He seduced a woman, a very young woman, barely out of her childhood. She would spend the finest years of her life with him, then he would tire of her. He enjoyed it, but the girls must have found it hard. He fathered his last child at 73, and I don't think he did an awful lot of parenting at that point. While it kept Chaplin young, it prematurely aged his widow. Here are Hollywood's 20 most evil actors who brought drama both on and off the screen. If you found this list as fascinating as we did, don't forget to hit that like button, share your thoughts in the comments, and subscribe for more amazing Hollywood stories. Until next time, stay tuned.